All right. Woo! All right. So, oh, wait. The, the slide. Okay, the slides are showing now. Okay, so yeah, I'm Carl Alexander. Uh, you can find me still. I'm still on Twitter, so you can find me on TwigPress or at carlalexander.ca. If you've ever seen a talk by me, um, I always have this slide because I love talking about advanced programming or or anything topic, uh, and I like to help you understand those topics, but. I always have a bit of material and things for you to help you walk you through this, but also I want to make it really open to all of you. If you have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to, to stop me and ask a question. It's better to ask me now than like keep it till the end and then you're lost for the, the entire rest of the talk because this slide is really important today. I think I'm going to lose a lot of people, so we're going to go. I love this saying, servers, we can't live without them. Uh, we can't live with them and we can't live without them. Whenever your server blows up, you're like, oh my God, like, why am I managing this stuff? Why am I dealing with this? How can I make this less painful for me to handle? And there's a few solutions here. So who here uses a server management system? So spin up, run cloud, server pilot, Okay, there's a couple of you. Uh, so the thing with those server management tools is that you're still responsible. So I've been a sysadmin since I'm 14. It was my first summer, summer job. I was doing Windows NT servers. Uh, I had a pager. Uh, no, I do not want to have a pager anymore. I'm, uh, nothing is more stressful than being on pager duty. So even with these server management tools, if something happens with the server, I mean, I use spin-up. Uh, there's still some times where the server, something happens with the server, spin-up sends an alert. You're still the one responsible for dealing with that, and that's still stressful. And that's usually when you get into WordPress hosting. So I assume everybody else here is going to raise their hand when I say, do you use WordPress hosting, right? Raise. Okay. Okay, so that's what you pay WordPress hosting for, right? You, you're like, I don't want to know anything about servers. I, I trust you, especially if you use the good ones, then they usually stay up. The less you know, known web hosting companies is a bit more rock and roll, but you still, there's still a problem with WordPress hosting. So who here has had an issue with a site where everything's good and then Oh, they write uh, you know, a viral article or something like that, and then the whole thing blows up. Or like e-commerce. E-commerce also is a really good example, um, especially. So in those scenarios, like you have to usually buy a hosting plan to deal with that worst case scenario. You have to like, and then you're stuck paying for that over-provisioned server or you're stuck managing up, upscaling and downscaling. So I, down, I deal with some customers where uh, they do it all themselves, and that's stressful too because if you forget, it's your money basically that you're spending forgetting to like upscale and downscale. So the goal of serverless is to address these problems. So the first question you're probably wondering is, what is serverless? And the second question that you're going to ask me is, are there really no servers with serverless? Literally everyone asks me that. And the answer is that, no, there are still servers with serverless. They're still there. Uh, I, I'm a, not a big fan of the term. It's a marketing term. Somebody in the marketing department decided like, oh, serverless sounds cool. We're going to use this term. And then so everybody started using it. And all the engineers are like, this makes no sense. And they're like, it's too late. It's out there in the wild. We can't do anything about it. This is the term we have. It's serverless. We're keeping it. But what is serverless? For serverless is basically what they call functions as a service. So it's like Google Cloud Functions, AWS Lambda, I think Azure Functions. Um, but what it is, is conceptually, it's on-demand computing. So what you do is you upload code, 
The code gets executed when in response to events. So something happens, a page view, uh, something triggered in somewhere else in AWS, and the code gets a, the code gets executed, runs, returns something, and then shuts down. You'll notice we don't mention servers, and what that that's because uh, server. Well, okay, I'm, I'm at the right slide. Okay, servers are basically outside of your sphere of concern. So really what serverless means, and that's where the confusion comes from, is that it's not that there's no more servers, it's that they're really, not, they're really outside your sphere of concern. And one thing I'll mention a bit later is a bit, I'm a bit like the person in the early 2000s that's like, have you heard of the cloud? And they're like, no, like you run your own data centers, obviously. But the whole point of the cloud is to not have to think about data centers. And the whole point of serverless is to not even have to think about the server itself. Uh, so it's not even a question of, oh, I don't have to think about like, data centers. I don't even have to think about the Linux box itself. So how does this work? Um, the best way I've found to explain that is to start with talking about how WordPress works today on a server. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with how uh, WordPress works on a server. This is basically how WordPress works on a server for almost every hosting provider. I always joke that they're just all selling vanilla and it's just different, there's different flavors of vanilla. So one person's French vanilla and somebody else another flavor of vanilla. So you always have an HTTP cache, so either you're using Cloudflare, or you're using WP Rocket, or something like that to like do the page caching. If that page is not cached, it hits the server slash WordPress, and then WordPress does either SQL queries directly to the database, or if you're using object caching, it will do uh, object cache requests and check if it has that and send it back. And then just that gets sent back to your browser, and that's like essentially like almost how every host, every WordPress uh, site, system, whatever is really hosted at this point. This came from like this slide comes from like a talk I gave in 2016, I think. It was called like the modern WordPress uh, server stack, and basically at, at this point everybody uses more or less the same thing. Uh, so that's what it looks like. Now, with serverless WordPress, we have to go a bit further back because what serverless WordPress is is really serverless PHP. So how does PHP work? Oh, didn't switch. Okay, how did PHP work on, how does it work on a web server? So we're gonna zoom it a bit further in. So when you're on the web server, so, Everybody here knows Apache, Nginx, we're good? Okay, cool. So normally you make, your browser makes a request, it hits Apache or Nginx, Apache or Nginx decides, okay, what are you asking me for me right now? Are you asking me for a file? Are you asking me for uh, PHP? If it determines that it's asking for PHP, it makes a call to the PHP interpreter. So if you're with PHP, with Apache, it used to be just PHP itself. If you're with Nginx, which most people are now, it's PHP FPM that you call. But the idea is the same. You basically, the, the web server gets the request, realizes that it's for PHP, sends it to PHP, PHP does its magic, you know, runs WordPress, the WordPress script, returns some HTML, sends it back, to the web server, and the web server is like, okay, here's the status code, everything, let me send that back to the browser. So that's how PHP works. So how does serverless PHP compare to all of this so far? So both of them will run code. So like I said before, when I explained what serverless is, I mentioned in response to an event. So in both cases, your serverless code and your regular, how PHP works right now, they both run your PHP code in response to the event. One is something called AWS Lambda, 
and decides, okay, we need to run this PHP code. With a traditional server, you basically have your Nginx that determines, okay, this is PHP code. Let's call PHP FPM and have it run it. So what's different then? Well, it's not just PHP now that runs without a server. It's everything. So when you're starting to think about serverless WordPress and serverless PHP, you're thinking about a service-based architecture. So now all the blocks that we were talking about earlier when we looked at it get replaced by services. Uh, I'm using a, I'm with AWS, so I'm more familiar with that, but there, we'll talk more about that in a second. But it, it starts looking something like this. So you have your browser making a request to some, uh, something called an API gateway, which acts a bit like your Nginx. So it receives the HTTP request. It's like, OK, what's going on right now? It determines, oh, we want to make a request to Lambda and sends it to Lambda. And then inside the Lambda, there's the PHP runtime and your PHP code. So your WordPress code would be here. And then there's a the PHP runtime, which I'll explain in a second. PHP runtime. So what is the PHP runtime? So the PHP runtime is really kind of the secret, not secret sauce, but it's the unique element that makes PHP, uh, serverless PHP work. So the best analogy that I have for it is like, imagine you have your Nginx directives that you have. Like, so when you configure Nginx, you have a bunch of rules. Those are the rules that determine what am I trying to do with this uh, web request? Am I asking for a PHP file? Am I asking for a regular file? Basically, the runtime acts as this layer, this, uh, the configuration, the, the host configuration, or the server configuration inside your Nginx or Apache. I'm gonna go, but, so once it does that, it does a couple of things. So it processes the Lambda event. So it receives an event from uh, the AWS architecture. It basically decides, okay, what am I trying to do here? Am I requesting a PHP file? Am I requesting a CSS file? Am I requesting something that should be a 404? What am I trying to do? So it figures what the event wants, and then it sends the result back. So it's gonna be an HTTP response, but the goal here is to mimic parts of the web server. So if you request a file, you return a file. If you want a PHP, it creates a fast CGI request and sends it to PHP FTM. And once PHP FTM determines uh, what the, once PHP FTM runs, has a response, sends that back. But it also manages the PHP FTM process. So each Lambda only has one PHP worker that's because Lambda can only handle one uh, event at a time. And the, the idea with that is that the whole thing is self-contained inside this one Lambda that acts, and I'm, I'm gonna get back to that because that's the really key point, is that this entire thing mimics basically one PHP worker. So if, you, if you're familiar with PHP FPM, you can configure it to have like a pool of workers that it can scale and downscale on demand. But each Lambda is essentially a PHP uh, worker. Now, if we start zooming out again, and this is where I might lose a bit of people, but right now I've shown you what it looks like just for PHP. But what happens if we like zoom out and we look at what our modern WordPress architecture looks if we move it to all services, looks something like this. So now you're dealing with, you still have your caching, you still have your, your HTTP cache, uh, but now you have your file. So who here uses something like uh, offload S3 or something like that? So, so you have to, we're gonna talk about that in the drawbacks, but you, you, all your media assets are in S3. So you have to determine whether you're requesting for a media asset. And then if you're not, it goes through the API gateway, which is our web server, the Lambda, which is our PHP worker, 
then we still have our caching, object caching, and our database. So that's what it kind of looks like at a high level here. So the essential part here to understand is that it's very, it's all around very similar. It's really we like swapped different parts of like the, the previous, like if, if you imagine like the, the, the previous picture that I show with just the modern uh, WordPress architecture, we just started swapping a couple of parts with services. And that's essentially what, uh, what the architecture looks like at a high level. So any questions so far? I'm going to ask that again. So, uh, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Uh, it's better to ask now than wait till the end. Um, so here, I want to talk about the advantages. So you might be wondering at this point, like, why? Like, why are you talking to me about this? Like, this looks really complicated. You lost me already. Why are we talking about this? Um, no servers to manage. Look. I've been, like I said, I started being a sysadmin at 14. I don't want to manage servers anymore. I don't want to be on a page, on a page or duty or whatever. Um, it's, it's a lot to manage servers. It's, it's tiring. Um, and it's not our area of expertise, you know? Um, I don't know servers as well as somebody at GoDaddy or, uh, uh, new fold or especially those ones that manage their own data centers, but even somebody at WP Engine, but they don't even know it as well as the people at AWS because the scale is completely different. Um, and not everybody's comfortable with servers. Like who here is comfortable with servers? One, two, three, uh, maybe, so three and a half, four. So, you know, we have almost a full, we have a half full room and I had four hands up. So there's not, there's a problem with that. We, we're not, most of us aren't, we're developers. We're not sysadmins. We didn't start our career being sysadmins. Uh, and that's stressful and it's stressful to be responsible for all of that. Even, even when you're with WordPress hosting and something goes wrong, it's stressful. And WordPress hosting tries to solve this issue, but the new problem that we're seeing, or at least that I'm seeing a lot, is scaling now, because WordPress is changing. Um, WordPress used to be just content sites, and now it's becoming more applications. Who, who here manages WooCommerce sites? Yeah, a lot of you. Who here manages LMS's site, like Lifter, LMS, LearnDash? Exactly, more and more people. Those aren't content sites, they're applications. Um, and scaling is an issue. Like if you're hosting a webinar and a thousand people show up you're, and you're like on a $50 a month server, it's gonna blow up. And then they're gone and then either you upscaled it ahead of time and then it's your responsibility to downscale it or uh, you just pay for that maximum scaling all the time. And that's also a problem for a lot of WordPress hosting because most WordPress hosting is single server. So there, I know that I'm not the only one working on this, but we're a couple of people trying to work on scaling WordPress elastically, like horizontally. And, but for most of us that buy, if you buy on WP Engine, you're buying a single server. You're not buying anything elastic that can scale on demand at that, I, at that um, quickly. You know, when you're sending a sale email with WooCommerce or your, your people are coming in with your webinar, that scaling doesn't happen fast enough. Um, that's called like the thundering herd problem. So with this, like I said, now each Lambda function is a PHP worker. So essentially, you can have thousands of them. Um, and you can scale it in seconds and not minutes. Because that's what I tried to do. Like this was like, I actually did even something crazier recently, but this was like two years ago. And basically 
I sent 1,500 users to, to, um, to check out on WooCommerce, and we basically got to 800 concurrent, so that means it was 1,800 PHP workers running. To give you an idea, usually if you buy, who here has a 96 core server that they pay for? Okay, well, I have a, cu I have a customer with that. They're $3,000 a month. You would need about five of those to, to run this. Um, the test I, I tested recently, that cost $10. Um, so that kind of scaling is really hard to do even with servers. Uh, Kubernetes is fast, but it's not that fast. And you end up with these kind of situations. That's what happens with the thundering herd. Like the first server comes online, it's already broken because it, like the demand's already too high, and then it's scaling, it's scaling. And especially for these scenarios, you're losing a lot of money while that's happening. So what do people do when I do consulting is they need to plan for the worst. So yeah, they're gonna buy those five, $3,000 a month servers because otherwise they're losing $10,000 a minute uh, in sales. So yeah, obviously they're gonna make sure that they have that. But like I said, that, like how much does that cost you just to keep that running? Or you gotta just do it yourself or talk with them but even then, like, like I said, nobody's really solved the multi-server thing, right? So I'm talking about five servers, but actually nobody's really done that yet at any sort of like really scale. So while I can give you a theoretical number of how much that would cost, uh, nobody can do that yet. And the cool thing is you don't have any of that with, with serverless. Um, all that you have is that you pay for what you use. So you pay when your worker runs and you're charged by the millisecond. So if, especially for these LMS sites, it's kind of cool because, oh, you get that webinar and then after that, it, people are gone and then you don't have to do anything. You're not paying for anything. There's no traffic to the site. You're not, uh, you're not doing anything. So you don't get paid for it. The only thing that you're paying for is your database because you can't just shut down your database and turn it on when you want. So maybe one day we'll get to that, but we're not there yet for that one. Um, so those are kind of the advantages, the real big advantages with serverless. Now, what are the drawbacks? You know, maybe you're thinking like, Carl, like this sounds too good. Like I don't trust you, like what the hell? Uh, one of the scariest part is even if I tell you cost less, Usage-based pricing is scary. You know, it's, there's one thing with paying, paying for a server, it feels safe. You know, you pay X per month, you know that each month you're paying $49. If you need more performance, you pay more. Simple. Predicting serverless costs? Okay, how many requests did it get? What's the average duration? Uh, like, what services got hit? Like, it depends on your usage pattern, like what application you're running and things like that. Even if it costs you less, like even if you would, I, like serverless is already competitive pretty much at the $49 a month plan. Uh, but it's still stressful and harder to budget for it. So even if I tell you it costs less, there's something safe about knowing that you're paying a fixed amount for that even each time. So it's cost less. And then the other one that, another thing that people don't always like is AWS. Who here uses AWS? Oh, wow, actually genuinely surprised. There's a lot of you because I'm used to like, when I'm told you, mm, like AWS, like I have like, I mean, who here is, was ever a Windows sysadmin? Okay, yeah. Who gets a PTSD from like the AWS consoles from, yeah, yeah, exactly, you get it. Like, you, it's, it's scary. Um, and you know, when you, when you tell somebody or I tell somebody like, oh, you're gonna need to like use AWS, they're like, oh my God, it's so big. Like there's so many things, there's so many servers, services and I don't know what they mean. Um, so that's like a scary part. And 
you might be wondering why not Azure or uh, GCP? And the reason for that is, unfortunately, it's not interchangeable. Like conceptually, there's the same, but as we saw earlier, we're not just using Lambda, we need the other services as well uh, for, for those things. So they're equivalent, well, then switch. Okay, they're equivalent, but they're not the same. So they don't have the same limitations, they don't behave the same way. Uh, so that's kind of like the why multi-cloud is kind of a pipe dream. Uh, like nobody really, everybody chooses one cloud and stays with it. Um, and the reality is that there's so much energy in the PHP community and all the other programming communities around AWS that it just, that's where the energy is and that's why it's mostly only on AWS that you'll find. There's some people working a bit on the other services, but most of the energy, if you look online, like the serverless PHP is called uh, Bref. So Bref is only on AWS as well. So that's one of the drawbacks as well. And then the last drawback is WordPress assumes you're on the server. So there's a few issues with that when, you know, like you can trick it, but there's still a few things that people are, might not be like comfortable with because of that. One, you can't install Teams and plugins directly. Why? Because it's read-only. You have to deploy. The way that AWS makes this so scalable is that you package the application and then it can like boom, create like 16,000 copies of it, uh, 1,600, sorry, but it could also do 16,000. But like, uh, it could do like thousands of copies of it, but for that to happen, it needs to be packaged. You can't be modifying the files or whatnot. So usually the way it works, if, who here works, it does enterprise? Yeah, so who here lets their enterprise users install plugins and teams? Exactly, nobody does. So if you come from an enterprise background, uh, it makes a lot of sense, but uh, if you're not, then it can be a bit of a sore point and depends on your, what your customer or client expects as well. Maybe they expect to be able to make modifications and things like that. Uh, the other part too is the media library. Um, I had to actually do a lot of R&D to get the media, because obviously when you upload a file, you're uploading it to a server. So what happens instead when you're uploading a file now? Well you actually have to upload it directly to S3. So none of the S3 plugins do this. Like you actually have to like send it directly because the thing is you might send the file to one, one Lambda and then you talk to another one. Like you can't be sure that the file that you uploaded is there. So you have to basically uh, send everything to S3. But that kind of like messes around. Like if you use a lot of media library plugins or media manipulation plugins, those don't work very well. You're better off using a CDN like Photon. Uh, no, is it Photon? Tachyon. Tach Photon, yeah. Photon, like something like Photon. I, have, I built something like Photon too, where, where I'll talk in a second about Emir, but, but that's the idea. You use, you use a CDN to do the manipulation and instead don't rely on WordPress to do it, which is where it's trending uh, largely, but still, that's still a drawback that you should be aware of. And then sometimes plugins assume that you're on server too, you know? I, most of the time, the really, the popular plugins that follow coding standards and PHP coding standards, WordPress coding standards don't have any problems with this. Uh, like I work with Beaver Builder, Elementor, and all the page builders. You'd think like this would like explode for them and it's like works flawlessly. Uh, it's usually plugins that don't follow conventions or, or things like that or do things that are kind of greedy. Uh, server greedy that will kind of cause issues. But you have to be aware that there's potential compatibility issues, so it's not perfect yet, but it's getting better every time. Um, all right, we're almost done here. No questions? Oh, yeah, uh, do we do a microphone? We'd like to ask how you manage PHP sessions in this. 
Uh, well, depends. PHP sessions can be managed different ways because you have, in general, with WordPress, they're cookie-based sessions. Uh, but obviously, you can't have them on, you can't do the sessions that are files, right? But there, you can do sessions that are SQL, you can do sessions that are Redis, or you can do the cookie sessions. They work fine. Uh, but by default, WordPress just does cookie sessions. So that's like, tends to be the standard, even in, with Laravel, it's cookie sessions. Like, it's almost never like stored directly on the server. Um, because like, this isn't common, again, because we're so, WordPress has always been single server, we do things that, like, that other PHP projects don't do. Um, and file sessions on a server does not work the minute you do any sort of like horizontal scaling with like two servers, right? If you had two servers, it wouldn't work. It, does, it, ha it wouldn't work either way if you had like file sessions on the server as well. Yeah, but in that case, we can use memcache already. Yeah, yeah, you could do a memcache. But I, I, only, I only have Redis with this, but yes, you could do memcache, so, but you could also do Redis for the sessions and that will work fine. Uh, it's really the, the ones if you use files to do the, the session storage that it won't work. Everything else, every other method is, is not server uh, dependent to do it. Like whether it's cookies or Redis, memcache or SQL to store the sessions. And uh, one more question. Yeah. What, what exactly you do to keep the Lambda functions warm? Because after a few minutes, if we, no, there is no request to the Lambda function, that will be in the standby state. Oh, I see somebody knows his stuff. Okay, so I'm going to nerd out a bit. So uh, with Lambda, so what he's asking is basically, normally the way it works with Lambda is like, they leave the, f the function running for about five to 10 minutes and then it shuts down. Uh, so if you don't get any, any request during that time, uh, like you will go back to zero and then the ramp up, the scaling can cause some issues. So the way that, you're, there's two ways you can solve that. One, there's, you can pre-provision functions uh, if you want to keep them always running, but uh, the other way is there's, uh, you can ping them. So you can, p like basically, I'm j like I'm ner this is probably above everybody a lot of people, but in CloudWatch you can basically set an event every five minutes. I ping, let's say you want to keep 500 of them running. I ping 500, and then it'll just keep them warm basically. So there's a small cost to that, but it's like what two milliseconds every five minutes. So it's very easy to do a cost a cost analysis on that as well because you'll know how much it costs and how long it runs, and it's just a ping. It's not, it's not even running WordPress, so it's, run, it's just really pinging the Lambda function to make sure that there's enough of them running. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I just wanted to... So we've talked about advantages and disadvantages, and one thing that I want to uh, close on that section is just when you're evaluating whether you want to use serverless or not, uh, I've talked a lot about cost. And it's really tempting to just compare cost. You know, serverless is expensive. I can just buy a $5 a month droplet from DigitalOcean or Vulture, and that will be Fine, but that's usually somebody that's comfortable with servers. Somebody like me will be like, oh, this is fine. Like, I can like, run this on this $5 a month droplet. But it's kind of a false equivalent. So you're, you're kind of being dishonest when you just compare the costs like that because there's a lot of intangible costs to managing servers, you know, like evenings ruined, uh, you know, no, it's true. Like, I had a server blow up on New Year's Eve this year. It's like, it, it's not fun. Like, uh, I still manage, even if I'm promoting serverless, I'm still managing servers for people. So I still have ones blow up on New Year's Eve. Uh, so it's not fun. Uh, there's intangible costs, and it's, there's mental health costs. Like, it's, like, stressful. It's just, it's... It's not something that you want to do. Um, I like who here is on pay, has ever been on pager duty. Yeah, there's a couple of them. How many of you enjoy being on pager duty? 
yeah, there's no hands raising. Uh, there's, there's nothing pleasant about being on pager duty. Uh, there's nothing pleasant about managing servers when it's not your area of expertise or something that you're comfortable with. And even when you're comfortable with it, like me, I'm still looking. I'm, I should be the last person here talking about serverless because I know servers so well, yet I'm the one talking about it because I don't like it either. It affects my mental health. It affects my life. Uh, I, and, and I don't want it. I don't want it anymore. And then the last one I think is really important is we really discount our time here. Like we're like, oh, I'll go fix this. Like you know, you know how much you charge your your clients, right? You you know how much you're worth. So you're like, oh, let me just go fix this. And then like two hours later, you're still trying to fix it, and you're like, oh, I could have you know. And then you can't charge your client because it's like your it's your responsibility. So it's just there. Your time is valuable. Um, so don't discount it. Like it, it's it's a part of the cost of of managing a server. You know, it might cost five dollars a month on DigitalOcean, but if it takes you like ten hours to set it up, I mean, those ten hours are still worth something. Um, so don't don't discount it. All right. So we're going to talk tools and projects, and I'm the only one that does serverless WordPress. So I mean, I'm. I've been. I, we were t I was talking about this before the talk started. I've been organizing work camps for a while, and I always feel really awkward when somebody does a talk and they're the only one that does something for that specific talk. And here am I. I am doing exactly that. Uh, so I'm serverless PHP has a lot of tools and options available to them. Uh, I'm the only, I was basically at Laracon in 2019. I saw Taylor Otwell come out with Laravel Vapor and I was like, this is so cool. I want WordPress to have this. And I just like started building it. Uh, and it's open source. So um, if you go to the Emir app account on GitHub, uh, you'll find everything that you need to run. Uh, the, you'll find the runtime, You'll, see, you'll find the runtime and the WordPress plugin that I use to make WordPress work on uh, AWS Lambda. But I still need to kind of fund myself because I do some consulting, but it, I, I should be working on this full time. So that's why uh, Sanjay introduced me. Like I work on Emir. Emir is basically the equivalent of, of Laravel Vapor. So uh, I'm gonna, I have to like speed it up a bit, but um, it's the equivalent of Laravel Vapor, so I just manage the AWS infrastructure. So it's not about like the serverless part. Like you could use my parts and just put everything up together yourself if you want. But for somebody that's stressed and you know, oh my God, I don't know anything about AWS. Well, that's kind of what that product solves. And also, I have GitHub sponsor uh, if you want to help me. But I'm sure that over time, there's going to be more and more people that is going to, there's the serverless framework. So if somebody wants to try to get this to work with serverless framework or help me get it to work with serverless framework, I would love that. Um, but for now, it's just me. And that's kind of what's happening. Uh, so I'm going to close it out while talking about the future of hosting. Uh, if you had to start a hosting company today, would you buy a server? No, no, of course not. Yeah, you get one in the cloud, right? Like, you know, like there's a reason, you, there's a reason I joke that I'm the guy in the early 2000s talking about like, have you heard about the cloud? And they're like, no, of course not. You build your own data centers and you manage them. It's like, no, that's like, you don't want to have to do that. Like if you don't like managing servers, you're going to like it even less having to go into the rack to reset it. Uh, <laughs> Like, I had to do that. Like, I had to drive to the office to reset a server in Iraq. It's not fun. You, obviously, you get one in the cloud. And serverless is kind of the next evolution of this step. Because not only do you want to not care about, like, the actual physical server, but really, like, who here likes doing, like, server updates? Ooh, who likes having to... <laughs> you raised his hand. <laughs> Uh, but you know, who likes knowing that after four years their Ubuntu LTS is is done, and then they have to migrate like everything to a new machine? You know, it's just like no, like serverless. 
Like, who here uses Next.js, uh, Vercel, or Netlify? Okay, there's not, I, I, would, I actually expected, considering like how much more JS there is in WordPress now, I thought there'd be more people. But whenever I talk with people from the JS space, they get it like right away. They're like, I just deploy the Vercel, and then I don't have to think about like how much memory, how many PHP workers, it just scales. Like, it does what it needs to do. I deploy and I forget it. And that's like what serverless is about. It's about deploying and, f and just having it scale and behave and just the code runs, it does its thing. And the cool thing with that is that it levels the playing field. So who here has ever heard of Fathom Analytics? So Fathom Analytics is like my favorite example of like the power of, um, of serverless. There are two people and one developer and they built a Laravel app that does like uh, privacy focused analytics and they, they deal with billions of requests a minute and they're one person, they're one developer and it's all possible about because of serverless because they just deploy and the whole thing scales and they can just, they can do it. Like they can, two people can take on Google Analytics with this tech. It's awesome, like that gets me so excited. Uh, I love it. And there's a lot of you in here that build products. So I, like, what I find exciting about working on this tech is like what cool stuff you could build. Like one of my favorite examples is like, what if Gravity Forms took on like Typeform? Like what if they just hosted their forms and just like took on Typeform? Uh, but like rethinking of, uh, rethinking how, what kind of products, what types of things that you can do with WordPress when you don't have to worry about scaling, especially since we're moving to more and more WordPress applications, uh, gets me really, really excited. And that's it. I don't think we have a lot of time for questions, but I don't know if there are any. There's, uh, do we have time for one? Okay. Okay, that's an annoying one, I'm sorry. Um, so thanks, first of all. But I have one question regarding um, DDoS attacks. So yeah. since DDoS attacks can be you know, held back by on a DNS level, but when they come through, yeah. every request, and if you find a very load-bearing request on a PHP level, will count rack up money. Well, right? okay, so for that, there's a couple. So if we go back, I mean, I'm not gonna, it's too hard to go back through the slide with a clicker, but uh, when you have CloudFront sitting in front, yeah. uh, you can attach the web, like Emir does that. You can attach the web application firewall and then put a rate limit on it and then you're kind of okay. Um, but you're gonna hit, unless they're really trying to bu cash bust the CloudFront, uh, because of how the architecture's like structured, it kind of mitigates um, uh, some of the DDoS attacks. But I'm, again, I'm like involved in all the serverless PHP like groups. So like I took a lot of the lessons. Do you, you I think you raised your hand for Fatima Linux, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, so you saw when they got like DDoS, yeah, right? Yeah. So I was like with Jack and like in their Slack uh, and yeah, like there's a lot of like the, the things that he figured out that are just already implemented in Emir that you can just turn on. Okay, uh, so from the write-up that they did after the... Yeah, from the write-up okay. and just from talking with him as okay, well. Nice. Uh, but usually just putting a rate limit at the is probably the cheapest and easiest option for that. But obviously if you're getting, like if a competitor decides to really attack you, then it's like you saw what he did, right? Like he, pay, he paid for like the expert the, the expert service, but those are always a potential issue, but DDoS, I mean, who here has had their server shut down by one of their hosts because they got like some sort of like attack or like, yeah, like that happens all the time. Like they're gonna do it to you. Like it's, cause, it's gonna cause problems, um, but the costing is still valid, but I think if you put some alerts and things like that, like we can talk about it, but like there are ways, and I'm making more and more ways to make that like as safe as possible. But one thing I do different from Vapor is that you don't get the unlimited scaling by default. So it's gonna cap your, your Lambda functions and you're not gonna end up with you know, 3,000 of them running for like hours. Uh, so that's, that's something that I did by default. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to stop here because I'm already five minutes over. But uh, you can find me here. Also, Twig Press, Carl Alexander, and the blog. The Emir blog has a lot of articles. So if you want to, a lot of the things that I talked here has very detailed articles uh, on the Emir blog that you can read because I like writing like 4,000 word articles. So basically, you can find like on the architecture on the runtime, all of that, you can find like you, all the write-ups on that. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carl, for the...